it looks like the opening session has wrapped up and uh, there's more people joining in this session. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and get started, make the most out of our time today. Um, so welcome, thank you so much for coming. My name is Katie. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in electrical engineering, past student governor to the Board of Governors. Um, now I do some work with the new chapter at Iowa State, um, as well as the Parent Communications Committee with the board. Um, so happy to be here today, happy to talk about this topic. Um, this session is all about successful practices. And our goal today is to one, discuss what makes activities successful and you know how to plan them. Um, so we're going to have a very interactive session, a lot of discussion, um, very fast paced. So I hope you brought your thinking caps and are ready to shoot off some answers in the chat and um, by speaking up as well. Um, so throughout the session, if you have anything you wanna add or say, feel free to request speaking access. You can also throw stuff in the chat but we're basically going to develop this Google Doc together. And at the end of this session, we'll have a resource that, you know, is kind of like a, a guide or a checklist or a list of questions you can ask yourselves as you're planning an event um, to make sure that you're on, on track for success, that you're not forgetting anything, you're, you're checking all those boxes, those kind of things. And then this resource will be shared after the session. So we're all here to contribute to this resource and make it a good one. So. That's why I said, I hope you are ready to speak up, contribute your ideas, because um, the more people who contribute, the better this resource will be. Uh, we'll also be talking about our successful practices database initiative at the end. Um, so like Joe said in the chat too, feel free to drop your chapter in there. There's also a poll already up. So um, I wanna know on average, how many activities does your chapter hold per week? Um, I put on average in this question twice, so uh, I guess that's my bad copy paste kind of error, but um, yeah, I wanna know how, how many events are you planning per week? Um, with this guide and this resource that we're developing too, um, you'll also be able to use that to kind of extrapolate a timeline for yourselves. So if you wanna plan you know, a trivia night, how early do you have to realistically start to put your best foot forward and do that well? So with that, we're going to get started uh, with our discussion. And the first thing I wanna talk about is what makes an event successful? So what do you all think? Uh, feel free to put stuff in the chat or request to speak. Either way, what do you think makes an event successful? Are there certain metrics? Are there certain you know, accomplishments? What, what do you all think? This isn't going to be a very big resource. Okay, here we go. Engagement by the people attending, awesome. Hey, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hey, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so I think that's a really, really good question. And I, I hope by answering this first, we can break the ice a little bit because we are here to hear from everyone in our audience. I think you all have really, really good ideas and I'm excited to hear about them. But at least in, in my context of mentality, I really think that, uh, that be a successful event is something where you can go in with a predefined goal and use that to evaluate how well you've uh, you've overseen the accomplishment of that goal. So for events, you might go in with a couple of small goals or one large goal or a combination of the two. But I know for us, we we'll typically uh, push ourselves to either for, depending on the event, if it's something technical, we might say something like, okay, if we have, you know, five to 10 people show up, that's a great start. If we can involve another student organization, that's even better. If we can involve some professors to show up who have relevant research to this technical speaker, that's even better. So I guess there's kind of two aspects there. It's like we give ourselves a couple of concrete goals we can work towards, and that also can help define a couple of different levels of success and show us how uh, receptive our university community is towards the events that we're holding. 
Yeah, yeah, I like that. So there's there's certain kind of metrics there that you can measure against and say, okay, you know, if there's so many people or so many collaborations or we're we're making a connection or something like that. It's not always attendance that, you know, is a successful event. You know, sometimes it's making a really meaningful connection with a company or a professor or another organization that's going to lead to more opportunities down the line as well. Um, any other ideas? And well, in, Andrea in the chat said engagement by the people attending, which I think is a really good metric. Most people go by the number of people who have attended an event, but engagement is such a critical aspect. You could have 200 people who don't ask a question at the end of a seminar, don't engage in your chapter meeting. And it's like, okay, well, why did we hold the chapter meeting? Why did we hold the technical event? So I think engagement is such a key point. Right, exactly. And another thing too, kind of following off of that, I would say is, you know, how willing are people to come back? Were they happy with the event and did they like it? And are they excited about the next one? Or are they kind of like, I got some free pizza and I sat there for an hour and that's it. Like, did it inspire them to want to be more engaged? Other ideas, what else do you all think makes an event successful? And also feel free to request to speak, put stuff in the chat. You know, it doesn't have to be a long-winded answer. It can be two words. You know, we want anything and everything because we're developing this document together. What was the goal of the event and did we achieve it? Yeah, definitely. I think... Similarly, too, was the event filling a need in the first place? Or is it addressing some sort of pain point in your in your department, in your community? Um, you know, are you going to be helping people with this event? Is it something that they wanted in the first place? And is it actually solving that problem? I really like the idea that Art put in the chat that doing an HK and report really helps you put the event in context because it makes you go through and enumerate number of participants, hours spent planning, people involved, relative impact. I think that's a really, really good insight. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So I think we have some some great ideas here about um, you know, what does make kind of an event successful and kind of how to evaluate that too as we move forward through this session. Um, so the next question I have for you all is, um, you know, why is it even important to hold high quality or successful events in the first place? And that might seem like a silly question. You're like, of course I want my events to be successful, but I think it's important to kind of reflect on this and think about, you know, the bigger picture. So why do you all think it's important to hold high quality events? What are the benefits? What are the reasonings? Yeah, and like Sandra said in the chat, planning events is definitely a strategic task. So <laughs> it's not always just what will we accomplish in the short term with this, but you know, how is it helping us long term as well? And I noticed we have a couple other people who are chapter leaders or on a board of governors who are watching too. And I definitely encourage them to either feel free to join the call or write in the chat. You each have very valuable perspectives and we'd love to contribute that to the conversation as well. To, uh, to answer the question on screen though, I know um, one aspect we've struggled with as a chapter, we're relatively new in terms of being reactivated. We're reactivated, I think four or five years ago now. We've always struggled with transparency on our campus. So I think one reason we strive to hold more and more successful events or more and more impactful events 
is just to get our name out there. If we invite a technical speaker that brings in a couple people outside of our organization, that's really good. That helps us a long way for getting word of mouth of our camp of our uh, chapter out there to our community. Yeah, and like Chloe mentioned in the chat too, building our community, that's also a very important, you know, piece of having good events and, you know, giving something people to kind of rally around and, you know, have in common. So um, I see the comment in the chat by Chloe. Uh, uh, the chapter did not really have any events before I became president. I started having meetings just to make it more of a community. I cannot stress enough the <laughs> importance of the community aspect. Um, definitely really important. And events help creating the community. Not also, not only, sorry, uh, inside your university community, but also within your chapter. I know for a fact, because I've seen many, many instances of that, events bring people together in your chapter as well. No, and I really like that point because I, I think as a more technically focused organization, we have a tendency of defining ourselves based off of technical metrics, but that brings up a really, really good point that the point of our chapters on the con on the flip side is also to be a community of peers and having community or social focus goals or community or social metrics for success are just as just as important so i definitely encourage the audience to think between both of these how would you like to see a technical event succeed like a workshop or guest speaker and how would you like to see a social event um, succeed like a chapter meeting or a game night yeah definitely and I think another point too, kind of building off of your point earlier, Joe, about, you know, building up a reputation, getting your name out there, you know, that also helps with creating more opportunities for your chapter in, in the future as well. So, you know, having a solid website or having done a good event in the past, you know, that can um, lead to people learning about your chapter, finding you online or whatever, and then they reach out and are like, oh, we want to do a company talk or, you know, I'm an alumni and I would love to get back involved or, you know, make a donation or whatever. So those things can be important too. having high quality events and, you know, having that consistent presence can lead to more opportunities as well. And I like, uh, I like Sandra's point that a good website and social media channel definitely helps out of curiosity and feel free to put this in the chat, but, um, out of our chapters that are present, who has a social media channel? I'm just kind of curious. Our chapter doesn't, and it definitely seems like something we should invest in. Yeah, definitely curious to hear more about that. And, and also too, if you don't, and you're interested in starting one. Um, you have a bunch of PR and comms committee people here talking to you right now, and, and we're happy to help and have a lot of resources, too. Um, I think, you know, another part of building reputation, building brand is also just getting people to want to join <laughs> your chapter after they're invited. If they don't know what it is, there's not a lot being offered by the chapter. You know, they may not see a lot of value in joining. So by creating high quality, consistent events, you're also building kind of the value proposition of your chapter and of Ada Kappa Nu as a whole. That's something to also consider. Awesome. Thank you, Sandra. You know, Clau, I really appreciate that. That happened to our chapter too, where um, we, we actually had a, uh, a past president make us a, a social media channel actually, and then they like disappeared into the ether before they ever gave us the password. So we do have a PUI chip and like Twitter floating around and another <laughs> website floating around. But no, I, I, I appreciate that you're working on getting access back to that website. I think it's, uh, it's definitely an important way of building some transparency with your community. Yeah, of course, and 
Of course, and uh, Clo, I am sure uh, it will be useful to your chapter in the future. But I know at the same time that it can be tricky, at least at the beginning, uh, trying to, you know, uh, start working again on social media. So if you would like some help or just some, you know, some insights from us, uh, feel free to reach to us uh, on Slack or through email. I'm going to uh, put mine in the chat. Awesome. So in the interest of time, I think we should move on to kind of our next component of this session. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, what does make an event successful and why is it even important? And again, I think the importance aspect um, is helpful to keep in mind because sometimes as chapter leaders, we get really busy and it's kind of like, okay, I have to do these 12 things and, you know, I just need to like get through it and check all the boxes and like make it through to the end. But keeping in mind and being reflective about why we're doing this in the first place, you know, that's, that's where some of that, um, those little details and that kind of like special sauce comes in, as Michael would say, of, you know, what else can you add? How can you make the experience better? And that can help in achieving all these goals too. Um, so, you know, sometimes, again, it just helps to be reflective, to remember why we're doing this in the first place, and that can help make events better as well. So let's now talk about, you know, all the different aspects of planning an event or an activity. Um, you know, it's, it's not as simple as, you know, we want to hold a workshop and then it happens tomorrow, just like that. <laughs> There's a lot of planning. Uh, Alexandra said planning is strategic. So, you know, just what are what are the different components of planning an activity or an event in your your minds? What do you think? Feel free to drop stuff in the chat. Any any kind of component of the planning process. So, I mean, I think the first thing, if we're going to plan an activity, we need to have an idea. What's the concept of the event? What are what are we even trying to do in the first place? Yeah, definitely. Find something. And to, to that end, uh, when you think of a concept for the event, uh, do you go for a brainstorming activity with your whole chapter or would you rather come up with some ideas and propose them to the chapter and then discuss with them which of them is the best one yeah for sure um one thing that's helped us in the past this is a tour that i got from actually a, a professor here at bu um, she's big into outreach and whatever she plans an event she comes up with basically a two sentence pitch it's like boil down a concept into two sentences and it really shows you what you're trying to accomplish and how you intend to accomplish it in an easy to uh easy to sell fashion so it's a really, really good strategy that helps us in the con concept phase really fine tune like, okay, what exactly are we trying to accomplish here? And what effects are we exactly trying to have? Even for small events, it can be really, really useful for pushing us in a good direction. Yeah, I, I really like that idea. Sometimes it's your, your ideas or your events can be kind of nebulous and it's just this like point cloud of ideas and you need to like, coalesce it into one thing. <laughs> and I think that can help kind of get to the heart of it. Um, other ideas for coming up with a concept in the first place, you know, do you, I don't know, do you do any surveys? Do you reach out to people in your chapter or in your department? How do you incorporate some of that feedback? I think that's a really great question and brings up, you know, a sub point to developing conscience is like, how do you gauge the needs and interests of your community? I know we've done surveys in the past to, uh, to mixed receptions, 
Um, chapter meetings are another way of doing it. But honestly, for, for the help of my chapter, I'm really, really curious to see how you guys effectively gauge this in your universities. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you you ask your chapter members, okay, what do you want to see? And then you get some blank stares. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes it's just hard to articulate what, what you need and what you want or what will be helpful to you. So like, I get it. But at the same time, on the chapter leader side, it can be kind of like, almost a little bit frustrating of like, tell me what you want. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we sent out a survey, I think it was two semesters ago, and we got very few responses. But then we tried building an event off of that. And, uh, and then like, no one showed up. And we're like, Oh, no. So definitely, I think this is like a huge overlooked part of the chapter making process is like, how do you how do you reflect what your chapter is looking for and probe what your chapter is looking for? Yeah, and Chloe here in the chat mentioned to sending out a Google form at the beginning of the semester, um, having some ideas and like a suggestion box. Yeah, having having like a suggestion box or a place for people to submit their ideas anonymously can sometimes be, you know, enough to kind of push people over the edge and get them to tell you what they want. Um, so that can be really helpful too. Awesome. So I think another thing of, you know, figuring out what people want. Um, yeah, and like Art said here, most students don't know to ask for it if they have never done it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely a, an aspect too. And I think figuring out how to, you know, get students to ask for what they need or how to get them to articulate that, that's that's something that's really challenging. Um, I think one thing I like to think about when trying to plan events is what would have helped me when I was a younger student? What, what was I complaining about to my friends or family or whoever of like, oh, I, this class needs me to know MATLAB and I've never been taught MATLAB before. You know, those kind of things where, you know, if you can identify what would have helped you, you know, oftentimes you're not alone in that. It's the same idea as, you know, if you have a question in class, it's likely that five other people have the same question and just a lot of people are too afraid to ask. So if you can do that self-reflection and identify those things, oftentimes those can be good ideas to help people as well. That could be a great activity at a uh, at an e-board meeting, sitting down with your e-board, which typically has students at various points within their uh, the academic career, and really just going through and denoting like, what would you like to see as an undergrad? Or what would, what would you have liked to see as a grad student? Like, how would a chapter like this have best aided you? I think that's a really, really good reflection. So thanks for contributing that art. Yeah, definitely. Any other ideas for kind of developing a concept or like, you know, where do you even start? Yeah. Okay. I think sometimes too, it can be strategic, kind of like we talked about before. If you're looking to develop a relationship with, you know, a company or an alumni or a professor or your department or other organizations on your campus, you know, sometimes that can be a catalyst for an event as well. You know, if you want to develop a better relationship with your department. Sometimes it's saying, okay, what can we do for the department to kind of get on their good side so that, you know, we can start that relationship. And uh, Art put another good comment in the chat saying that they started asking friends who didn't join yet. And most of the time they have people, um, they, have pe they have people who are interested, but it's, but it's key to reach other students. And I think that's a really good practice looking to people who are not part of the chapter to see, well, first of all, what their opinion is on the chapter and as well, what would make the chapter more alluring to them. I think, you know, we have the the reflection that it's like, oh, the chapter is for the members, but really, you know, our chapter on campus is for the community and getting in touch with the community is a very important part. And chapter sometimes struggles with things like misconceptions or misconstruedance from the advisors or departments. Uh, 
I know one bottleneck that I've seen a couple of times with HK and chapters is sometimes they're perceived as uh, as as almost elitist. So it's good to know like where are the falling points when it comes to our advertising on campus or personality on campus, and what can we start doing to change that? Yeah, definitely. I um I am um, also think that uh, taking a look at what other uh, events are going on uh, in your campus also helps. Like. Uh, let's take a look at what other associations are doing, uh, what points they are touching, and and maybe see if there is a trend, or if there is something that is clearly missing and that we can and fill that niche. So I think that helps too. Yeah, yeah, it's you don't want to create the same thing that another organization is creating and step on their toes or try to compete with them or you know reinvent the wheel. Um, Sometimes you have to identify what is your niche on your campus and how can you know you work in that area to deliver the most value. Okay, um, I think we should kind of move on to another component of planning a successful event. So you know, say you have a concept in mind. Um, now it's kind of about the implementation and the delivery of that concept. And I think one of those is format. So is it is it interactive? Is it a speaker? Do you have food? Is it online? Is it in person? You know, how do you all navigate kind of figuring out what's the best format for each type of event? And I think, you know, the pandemic has made this especially interesting, too, of trying to figure out, you know, do you do another online event when the market is kind of saturated with online events? Do you do something in person? Will, will people not want to come if it's in person? Do you try to do hybrid? Does that take away from the people that are online versus not? Yeah, Kyle had a good point too here in the chat about asking your department head. And they might also provide funding, which is a good thing too. <laughs> All right. Yes, and Andrea is saying some events do need to be um, in person. Um, you know, if you are doing some sort of food or, you know, going out with other people, socializing, a lot of times that's partially better or better delivered in person. Um, I think whether or not to do food, that that is often a budget question of can we afford this? So that's something to think about. Yeah, definitely. I don't I don't know how other people's or experiences are on campus. Um, but I know typically when clubs hold event, it's it's usually within the engine the main engineering building so if we can get a poll on how big we expect the event to be that can be something um whether we do in person versus virtual i know one benefit out of the whole zoom era was seeing how easily interconnected we are so we've been doing more hybrid events where we can bring people from across the country virtually and for that, we'll probably try to look for a room on campus with one with a large screen to be able to host that um, I think you bring up a good point, though, that it's like when you're dealing with the format question, it really is a question of where can we go or how can we host this so that we can affect the target audience? Because if it's something like within your chapter, it's really like, well, how many chapter members do we expect to show up? Or if it's like, oh, you know, we're bringing a lecturer, so we're going to want something like a lecture hall, that's fine. But I've seen other chapters do things like uh, hand out cookies during finals, and they had to be a little bit more selective about where they wanted to go um, on a centralized point in campus to hand out cookies to advertise their chapter, or they might synergize with the department and hold their event near the department office. So I really think that this is a, a good question to dive a little bit more into. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think another piece too, or 
here, Kyle, is saying academics can be pretty competitive and they probably see student events in other departments or departments at peer institutions. And have said, I wish our department had a student group to host something like that. So yeah, that's, that can be another kind of aspect too. And, and to your point, Joe, about, you know, doing a poll or trying to like kind of get an RSVP kind of thing. I was just talking to somebody yesterday in one of the networking sessions of, you know, we've kind of had this problem this year where it seems like a lot of people are interested in the events. They like sign up to get the online link and like stuff like that. And then something somehow happens in between that excitement and actually showing up <laughs> to the event where like, you know, that conversion rate, it's not great. Um, so, you know, that, that can also be challenging too. Um, I guess the nice thing about room reservations is you have the room you have. If it's too big of a room, you already reserved it for that time and people can't go back in time and take it from you. So they can't be too mad, but it is kind of an interesting question of how do you actually gauge what you need versus, um, or like, how do you predict what you'll need in the end? Oh yeah, and I think that's such a good question because we've noticed the exact same thing where it's like, we're trying to host a online event or virtual event or even an in-person event. And the vibe we get ends up being not as reflective as the total number of participants compared to previous years. So maybe in the chat, if we could do a little brainstorming, I'd be curious to see if anyone has similar observations or maybe some ideas what could be going on. Like, could it just be basic Zoom fatigue where people are not as interested in virtual events as we push for more of an in-person environment? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a tough question. And it's also one that can be, again, a little bit disheartening sometimes too. If you think a ton of people are going to show up because so many people seem excited. And then when it's like three people, you're kind of like, oh, well, <laughs> I guess we're still doing this event, but I was expecting kind of 20 and I have my hopes up a little bit. And yeah. I like, uh, I like Garrett's comment in the, in the chat here that focusing how you recruit for your event is a great way of better encouraging and engaging your audience. Um, I, I kind of like this line that you put here you'd be perfect for this event because like, yeah, definitely. If you can, if you can make that event more personal for someone in some sort of profound way, then, or even some sort of little way, then I think it's going to be more likely that they go to show up. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So I think we have some good questions here about what to ask ourselves when we're trying to plan an event and trying to decide on format, because at the end of the day, this is really going to be, event specific, it's going to be university specific, it's going to be chapter specific. All those factors are going to play a role. So there's no universal rule here of, oh, you have to do it online and you have to have this many people and you have to do an RCP. There's, everything's a little bit more gray than that. So um, there's also what Sandra just put in the point of, in the chat of um, how do you keep your members engaged and having them work on something is, definitely helpful if you can give them ownership over something that can help, you know, better staff your events or, you know, create people who want to come back to your events too, uh, or get involved with your chapter too. Okay, awesome. So I think in the interest of time, we have to keep moving along. Um, but the next kind of piece is um, timing. And this kind of fits in with formatting as well, but how do you decide what day of the week or what time or what part of campus you have your event on and all those kind of things? Um, and I think this can be a tricky one too because everybody has different schedules. Some people have a lab on Wednesday nights. Some people have to work on Thursdays. Like, how do you create enough kind of like diversity in the timing of your events so you're not missing out on people? So I can share a personal experience that still hurts when I <laughs> think about it. So at the very beginning of my 
um, first sales officer at the Mono chapter. Um, I was assigned to um, create an event because we had a speaker from the US. And the point is that the event was, I ha it had to be on Monday afternoon, 2 p.m. in a time of the year where a lot of people are graduating. So as you can imagine, <laughs> finding people was hard because the time, the day, and the specific period of the year uh, <laughs> did not help <laughs> in trying to recruit people. So I've learned from that experience. Still hurts. Has been four years, if I, if I remember correctly, but it still hurts. And um, um, I've always tried to go for a hour where most people are done with their classes or laboratories, which is usually 6 to 7 p.m., kind of. I think that's such a great question because there's kind of two different forces at play when you think of timing. You can either say, well, you know, if I have similar themed events, I want to keep them at the same time. So it's a bit like a series so people can expect when it is to increase our attendance. But then if you have people who um, are interested but have a conflict at that time, they're never going to be able to attend. So it's like, do you want consistency in your events or do you want some more versatility in your events? And I think a combination of the two is definitely important. Um, and especially if you go and create an event and you get a lot of, um, excuse me, a lot of pushback about a time, that could be some encouragement to adjust the time before you hold the event itself. Yeah, yeah. and like Kyle said too, it, it can help if over time you establish, okay, HPN general meetings are Mondays at seven, you know, try not to schedule your lab. <laughs> for a Monday at seven if you have a choice between sections because then you'll miss the HPM meeting and that kind of thing. So that can be helpful as well. And I do think with a little, uh, a little foresight, you can also mitigate some problems that might arise. Like uh, let's say you have some new members with conflicts at Monday at seven for your meeting, but we can employ previously talked about concepts to try and, uh, and mitigate that issue. Like if you have also an anonymous feedback form or you release the agenda to your member base ahead of times, then they have a new avenue to engage with you, which is important too. Right, definitely. So I think in the interest of time, we should keep moving along. Um, the next kind of piece I think is advertising. So you have an event concept, you know how you're going to do it, you know when you're going to do it, but how do you actually get the word out and, you know, try to reach new audiences, get people to show up, those kind of things? So what, what advertising strategies do you all use for your events? And feel free to just drop them in the chat or request to speak. Either way, it's totally cool. Is it social media? Is it flyers? Is it department emails? What What are you using? I know uh, pre-pandemic, we did rely on flyers pretty heavily, like something we could hand out, especially at the beginning of the year, we would plan a couple of big events and hand out the flyers during our big um, club recruitment fair. So people could just like add them to the calendar. We use a Google Groups to be able to try and have a collective place where we can just send out an email. Um, but recently, we've definitely been leveraging um, department emails. Um, our department sends out a weekly email with like upcoming events and everything like that. That's been a great way of reaching people who might have missed us at those previous two venues. Yeah, definitely. I think our chapter has been using kind of like our own weekly newsletter. So we do that like every every Sunday afternoon, put together a weekly newsletter. We use MailChimp and just the free version. So then we also get some analytics too, which is nice. We can see, oh, you know, 45% of people have opened this. And, you know, this link is getting a lot of clicks. So people might be, you know, excited about that thing and that kind of thing. Also seeing Instagram stories and posts, social media. Yeah, and, and that's a good point too about flyers. Sometimes too, if, 
you, you see one of those bulletin boards in the hallway and there's, you know, 80 flyers on it and they're all overlapping. People are probably not going to read it very much. <laughs> Yeah, word of mouth and I, would be really important. Yep. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And sometimes words of word of mouth works even better than, you know, uh, posts on social media. Of course, they're important. But word of mouth is, I guess, more personal. Uh, you tend to trust more someone you know rather than a, um, you know, uh, page on, on social media. So um, this is why I, I was... Um, uh, writing before that, uh, planning events is strategical. It, it has so many benefits uh, having a well thought, well planned uh, event. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, another one can be if your chapter has like a Discord server or a Slack or you know something like that too. Being able to just you know post reminders real quick. Um, also going around departments, writing on chalkboards and whiteboards, like Garrett said, that can be a good one too. Um, I think yesterday somebody said that their chapter has, you know, a Google calendar that people can subscribe to. So they can just add the, the chapter calendar to their own calendar. And then, you know, they'll get a notification on their phone, like, oh, hey, you have this in 15 minutes if you want to go. And there's the details right there in the calendar event too. And that could be helpful. Out of, uh, out of curiosity, our group talked about this a little bit. We tried it um, like before the pandemic, but um, has anyone tried using or leveraging like undergraduate um, introductory classes to advertise events? Like I know when we last held our intro to coding slash electronics workshop, we went to the baseline electronics class to advertise it. Like we talked with the professor, got a small time slot at the end of an event. Have people found that to be a successful technique? Yeah, I mean, I can say I've I've found it to be successful. Um, you know, if you can get a professor to talk to their class about your event that's maybe related to what they're doing, you know, if we're holding a MATLAB workshop, we can, you know, go to the signal processing class that uses MATLAB all the time and be like, oh, hey, we're having this workshop. If you want to tell your students about it, you know, we would appreciate that. Or we have our tutoring service. So we try to ask some of those professors to put an ad for it up on their Canvas page so that you know, students see that as they're looking for help on their homework or whatever frantically the night before it's due. <laughs> you know, those kind of things of just kind of strategically placing information and announcements so students come across it can be helpful as well. Um, very active tutoring session, definitely. Um, yeah, go around to every class and let people know. Yeah, classroom presentations can be really helpful. And it also helps build your brand recognition on campus as well. You know, people remember, oh yeah, my Circus One class, HKN came and talked and told us about like all these events and stuff like that. And then they get invited a year later, you know, that can help jog their memory and, you know, they know who you are and they know that you're real. <laughs> okay, um, so let's keep moving along. We are kind of towards the end of our scheduled time, but I believe the next, next session isn't until 11.20. So we'll try to just kind of wrap this up in the next five to 10 minutes or so. Um, but I think, you know, two more aspects are logistics and then post-event follow-up. And so by logistics, what I mean is, you know, figuring out who's going to meet the pizza delivery person at the door to get the pizza. Who's going to, you know, grab all the stuff you need from your storage room to set up your info table? Who's going to be volunteering for the event? Um, you know, do you have to put together slides? Whose responsibility is that? And kind of figuring out all those extra little moving pieces that go on during an event. 
Um, if you're hosting a skill building workshop, who's going to pick up the Arduinos from the department IT or the IT department um, in your ECE department? You know, those kind of things of trying to make sure all your decks are in a row so nothing goes wrong. Um, and again, this is really event dependent. So I don't think we need to spend too much time on this one. But the other piece too is just post event follow up. So do you all uh, do any sort of outreach to your attendees afterwards, try to pull them, survey them, get some feedback on the event? Um, you know, do you do any sort of thank you gestures for your volunteers or for your speakers? Um, you know, how do you reflect on the event as a chapter or as an e-board? Um, so what does that all look like for you all? You know, I know for, for my chapter, we have our weekly officer meetings and every week we start by looking at the past week's events and we talk about what went well and what went wrong. And we, we write it down and just try to like get those feelings and thoughts out there um, so that we can get an idea of, okay, is this something we actually want to do again in the future or is it no longer serving us? And that's kind of a good exercise to do as you go along as well. So talking about logistics, um, I can tell you that in my chapter, we have an area that is uh, solely dedicated to handling the logistics of the event. Uh, may that be finding a place when we could find a place <laughs> to host the events or um, food or um, you know, making sure speakers could reach the place and so on and so forth. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, my chapter had a company talk and the company was speaking to us virtually, but we had like an in-person watch party and we didn't think to ask who would be the name or what would be the name of the speaker from the company. So we were sitting there in the room, like trying to start our meeting and we're like, okay, yeah, I think we're, we're still waiting for the company. And then a guy just started talking and was like, oh, hi, I'm Todd. I'm from the company. And he had been there for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> so that's something that was like a little bit embarrassing, um, but it's just a logistical detail that we didn't think to ask. But now we know that's like a lesson learned for us of, OK, we should ask while we're setting these things up, who's actually going to be the speaker so we know what to expect. But yeah, um, anything else in terms of logistics or post event follow up, um, putting together an event debrief? Yeah, definitely. I think also we've talked about this a little bit throughout the SLC already too, but thanking your volunteers and thanking your speakers, showing appreciation, that can go such a long way into developing those relationships and maintaining them. One thing that I've uh, I've mentioned to the chapter a couple of times, um, I was on the e-board, I'm now advisor of the chapter, and I, I've been encouraged them to consider developing, is uh, something I like to call a novel of calamity, which is basically all those tips of general events or specific locations where things have gone wrong. So like, for example, it's like when you invite a speaker, make sure to get the name ahead of times and just like small little bullet point details that can help the next person who's trying to plan one of these events succeed. So it could be something that's more categorical. Like if you have a speaker, make sure to do these key points, or it could be something very specific. Like there's a couple of rooms we've rented in the past where we've noticed like, oh yes, 
this room uses an old adapter to connect to your computer. So if you have an HDMI port, you're not going to be able to connect to your computer. And aspects like that can be really, really important to note for follow-up events in that location. Yeah, definitely. I tried to host a skill building workshop a couple of weeks ago, and I got there like an hour and a half early because I was so worried about the projector, and I needed that whole hour and a half to figure out how to work the projector. So, <laughs> you know, things like that too can be can be difficult. Yeah, asking of an attendees, definitely. And I think too, a lot of times if you can ask people at the end of the event in person, I think you can often get a lot more valuable feedback than sending a survey like two weeks later, because right at the end of the event, it's still fresh in their mind. You can just ask a couple of people like, oh, what did you think? Is there anything we should do differently next time? And just try to get you know, their, their honest take on it and read the room or read between the lines and note down some of those things too. Yeah, actually, one thing that I've really liked what the new eboard at my chapter has been doing is when they've had an event, there's usually a couple of slides associated to like introduce a speaker or something like that. And always the last slide has a QR code to an anonymous feedback form. Well, there's two actually. There's one for signing in just to check who showed up. And then there's another one for anonymous feedback for the event and just encouraging people just to like grab that form right at the end of the event, spend the extra two minutes while we're all together and give feedback on the event. Yeah, definitely. So we just got an announcement that I think maybe we're supposed to like wrap up a little bit soon. Um, but I think we have some really good points here, kind of detailing all the different aspects of an event and questions to ask ourselves, things to think about um, that can help us put, you know, all of this in context. And when we go back and think about you know, what makes an event successful? And, you know, why do we want our events to be successful? This can all help us in that planning process. And so this document is something that I'm going to clean up a little bit and that we're going to share with people after uh, this session or after the conference. Um, so this will be something you can refer back to. And as you're planning events with your um, officers, with your e-boards, with your chapter members, you can ask yourself these questions and use that to inform your decisions too. I think in the end, you know, what's really important is making sure that you're, you're doing an event um, because it's valuable to your chapter, to your community, uh, to your department. You know, sometimes it's, oh, well, our chapter has done this event every year for the last 10 years, we have to do it. But if nobody's attending and nobody likes it, Maybe it's not the best use of your time, too. <laughs> so that can be something to kind of keep in mind and um, use to gauge when you're planning your events or deciding what concepts to pursue. Um, and another thing to kind of keep in mind, too, is collaboration. That can be a very powerful force in developing events. Um, but also, you know, knowing kind of the expectations and the collaboration, what can what are you going to get out of it? What's the other organization getting at it, out of it? Who's going to do what? Those kind of things. Um, and one last thing I wanted to point out too is that we do have our successful practices database. So if you're a chapter officer, you can access this. Um, you can go in um, under chapter operations on our website. And then this is one of those blocks on that main page. And here we have over 100 activity ideas um, of all different things that are going on. Um, we will be probably posting this doc in the chapter leader Slack so um, that's a great place to get it. Um, I think there's also some other ways that resources are being shared throughout the SLC from other sessions, like slides and stuff like that. So we'll talk to Michael about how to get those out. Um, but again, this database has over 100 activities in it, and we're continuously developing it. So if you want to see what other chapters have done, get some more inspiration for what you could do, um, this is a great starting point for those ideas. And also too, as you submit your activity reports for your own chapter's activities, they could be included in this database. So if you have any other questions about um, you know, the database, what we talked about today, everything else, um, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, we're all on Slack. Um, we're all you know, at this conference too. You can message us through the conference platform, meet up with us with networking, schedule meetings with us, all those great things. 
Um, Joe, thank you for putting the Slack link in the chat too. So um, with that, I think, you know, we're probably at the end of our time, so I'm gonna wrap up, but thank you all again for coming. I hope this was helpful. Um, and if you have anything else that you'd like to have us add to the stock too after the meeting as well, feel free to reach out. So yeah, thank you all again.